the construction company makes us more money quicker than the architecture practice. Episode 159. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking to Sean McAllister, who is one of the co-founders of Sean and Stephen, an architectural practice based in East London who specialise in residential. They've done a lot of public work, art installations, um, resident multi-unit residential developments, uh, affordable co-working spaces, as well as temporary museum installations and high street regeneration projects. So this conversation was really quite fascinated because many architects that I speak to are looking at new ways of evolving their business model. And Sean has done exactly that with the creation of the company Pencil and Brick, which is ultimately a one-stop shop design and build company. So Sean has taken on wearing the hat of project manager of contractor. And in this episode, he talks to us about many of the constraints that he was experiencing whilst delivering residential projects, both from the architectural design side and from the contractors team side, and how pencil and brick as a business innovation seeks to solve many of these constraints. So sit back, relax and enjoy Sean McAllister. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Sean, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Uh, thank you for having me on again, Ryan. Always a pleasure, Sean. So you were actually one of the first podcasts I ever did back in, I don't know, when was it? 2015, 2016? I think it was 2017, early 2017. 2017, yes. It was It was one of, one of the early ones. So brilliant to have you back yeah. on the show. A lot of time has passed since then. Obviously... We've been good friends since our Grimshaw days back in 2008, 2009. And it's been really wonderful watching you evolve, watching your practice evolve, um, and some of the kind of very exciting developments that you're engaging with now, which I thought would be a really good uh, theme for today's podcast, because you've moved away from traditional architectural business model um, and have started merging your practice with construction and actually taking on the role of a contractor which is a, a very interesting subject and I know a lot of our audience are, have got aspirations to do such things so perhaps mm-hmm. we could start by um, just giving us a bit of background about Sean and Stephen the practice where that's at now how it began and kind of bring us up to date yep easy no small task um <laughs> Sean and Stephen Limited started in 2013, about a year after we won our first competition. We speak about it a bit in the previous podcast. I think it's episode 199. I looked it up earlier on, on the on, on the American um, right. podcast list. And um, we're, uh, we won a public realm competition to do some shop fronts uh, in Walthamstow, London. And it snowballed from there. We won projects off the back of that. And since then, those first, well, in those first five years, we started to gravitate towards private residential work in London, renovations, extensions, basements. Um, But we also had our hand in some commercial work like co-working spaces or um, art installations um, at the Museum of London and things like this. And we are um, about to reach our ninth year and we have six employees at the minute, which is, you know, really exciting and scary and um, paying all that payroll every month and um, making sure the invoices are in before that. And one of those six are being employed by our construction company, Pencil and Brick. But I'll go back a step. 
in 2017 through to 2019, we, Stephen and I, started to think about what would it take to run a design and build company rather than just an architecture company. And, um, and the opportunity came up uh, to work closely with a building team and start a company. So we did it. We took the plunge. We thought, let's have an adventure. Let's enable it to fail if it needs to, but let's go for it. So in 2019, we started Pencil and Brick, um, as in the two objects. And uh, obviously, I hope the name sort of speaks for itself, but that <laughs> uh, mer merge and design and build. And so Pencil and Brick's purpose was to build projects that we designed and we wouldn't build anything anyone else designed because right. we thought that's where um, the efficiencies and motivation would come for us would be the control of the quality of the construction build but so, also so, 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 Sean and, so Sean and Stephen was the design company producing the the, the kind of works yeah. up until a building regs phase or wherever it was you're, you're going up to and then pencil and brick would take over the execution that's right the the attraction that we were pitching to clients and still do and it because it is true is that if you use us you don't need an architect at construction phase because you have an architect as your builder or if you like you, you can call us a project manager but ultimately we're your builder we're one point of failure mm -hmm. um one one person to pay one person to have all the insurance that you need yep and it it really is streamlined it's it just one thing that we've discovered by doing this process we've discovered many things but one thing is we've realized that when we now are an architect at stage five construction and there's a separate builder oh my god how inefficient it is <laughs> and not not just for communication, like communicating three ways, finding out a problem, then trying to work out how to communicate to the client about does this impact the construction contract or not, or is there an impact on valuations or variations and so on, pissing off the builder by being too pedantic about things and so on. But also you feel guilty when you're an architect, when, when you have the knowledge we now have with Pencil Brick, when you're an architect at stage five, you realize that the clients tend to be paying twice for the one role. They're paying for the architect to be some something like a project manager, something to check quality and check the contract. But they're also paying for the contractor to have someone doing that at the mm. same time. And then they're sort of cross-checking each other um, and feeding back. So I can see um, there is a benefit in high-value complex projects, but we've been doing work up to about 500,000. So the the your kind of traditional services in construction administration. Yeah. Are you no longer you're no longer doing that as the architect in pencil and brick. And uh, you're right. So th this is not your traditional procurement route. What we are doing is working with um our knowledge about construction bringing the integrity of an architect to being a builder which doesn't look at all like a normal builder, by the way, <laughs> you know, because mm. it, it's absolutely essential that, um, that we demonstrate continually and reestablish our trustworthiness and honesty um, and transparency in a way that I don't think I've ever seen another builder do it. Things mm. like declaring trade discounts and um, showing all the numbers of the project together you know we collect a lot of data because we know how to use spreadsheets unlike a lot of other builders <laughs> you know, who are sometimes um not don't have office staff and so on but uh, we still operate a building contract either with the federation of master builders or the royal institute of british architects uh, their standard contracts and we still um offer a lot of the same terms that we'd ask a contractor to sign up to if we were the architect on a project uh, at stage five construction. So um, aside from that, we also look at some other interesting things like starting to onboard the construction team earlier in technical design rather than waiting until a tender process begins. Um, 
and we've got very vocal recently about um, how wasteful lost tenders can be and how that's probably pushing up a lot of prices for clients who select a builder because mm. they have all these tenders that they have to pay for that they don't end up using. But I can talk more about that separately. Yeah, well, that's that's a very interesting aspect of um uh, of of procurement so you guys are basically doing like a negotiated tender from the outset where you're able to bring in the contractor early on you're able to get much more cost assurance for the client that's right if we can be brought on with some confidence um not 100 percent confidence but there's a there's a willingness and an eagerness to work together after planning to to build then we can start pricing the project up at that that point. That that could literally save you months of time if you were the client. That could save you months of time instead of waiting until the end of a building regulations package is produced, or um, you know, get all your statutory consents, um, party wall agreements, and so on, and then go out to tender and then compete. We can start pricing during during technical design, which is a mind blowing thing to do. And then we negotiate, like you said, as a negotiated tender where we um, we keep going back to the the drawing board and the pricing in tandem until the scope and the budget work for the client. Mm. And, um, you know, nine times out of ten, it's worked. Do, do you ever have a situation now then when a client might want to not use you as a building service? So do they do they have the option or the ability to say use Sean and Stephen for the design work and then they bring in their own contractor? Or, yep, are, exactly. or are there projects where you might feel we're good for the design, but this in terms of say it was say it was like a project outside of your usual build sector mm. and it was a retail project and you actually, you know, we're very competent in being able to design the retail, but we're not sure that our contractor fit out team would be the right team for that. So that you would then do you ever have that kind of situation happen and, and how do you deal with it? That's right. It, As you'd expect, we have to discover fairly early on if we're a good fit for each other separately for the design and separately for the build. Um, for example, the architecture practice can do so much design work remotely. Um, I mean, like nowhere near the site of the project. Whereas the build team, because we have real humans that live places that need to travel to site every day and then travel back from site every day, um, and they almost entirely live in the east and north of London, <laughs> that, that that really limits what you could do, let's say, you know, towards the M25 on the south, uh, the ring road of London, um, on the going towards Brighton on the south because it would it would take hours to get there and hours back we, um, and that doesn't work for our current build team. Now there's obvious interest for us to to look at growing teams that are in different parts of London and then different cities but that's I'd say that's more of a five-year plan than what we're trying to achieve right now is um, solidifying an, a sort of a lapping amount of construction projects within the M25 um, and in the north and east, although we've been doing work in the south anyway, but you know, you you got to try these things. So um, there's that, but also a certain type of complexity or insurance issue might come up if a, we could design a, like a <laughs> two-story basement. We haven't, but we could, and we wouldn't necessarily want to build that. We may go to a, a, a specialist subcontractor for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, or we might not like the risk associated with it and kindly say we'd love to be your architect rather than your builder on this. So we try and say that as upfront as possible. Um, with so what, what have been some of the, the complexities that you've discovered in actually running the, the contracting company? And how does it, how does it differ from architectural services? There's an interesting thing that happens when you're running your own business of architecture, I think, as a practice. And you may, especially when you have more staff joining you, some employees who start to take um, the the important design work off your to-do list. And you, you sort of lament that it's going away, don't you? But 
um, you, you've matured a bit probably by this stage and realized that university oversold the, the value of <laughs> tweaking where the built-in seat goes or um, the funny shaped window or the cladding. There could be a lot of joy in those things, but as a, when you run the business in architecture, you, you start to see the importance of the design of the practice rather than the necessarily the design of individual projects. And what's interesting there is when we started the construction company, Pencil and Brick Limited, they, we realized that so much of that thinking is transferable to run in the architecture business, run in the construction business. We knew how to establish um, a way to value our time, a way to value the project irrespective of the time that we're on it, the seal cost, the amount of money that we can take in, um, really looking at profits and overheads, forecasting, cash flow, managing bank accounts um, and working spreadsheets. These are all things that you do in an architecture practice. And it's um, it's like some of that stuff's missing in a lot of the small builders in London. So actually we had a leg up over a lot of other people in terms of data collection and reacting to, um, to profit and sales and so on. But some of the biggest changes um, that you don't do, even as an architect at stage five, but as a builder, what you have to do is really negotiate uh, with a client on these huge sums of money. You know, like nearly a half a billion pound project is a lot different from trying to arrange 50,000 pounds worth of fees over two years or something as an architect practice. Mm -hmm. And you're asking for this money and maybe like a huge down payment and all that. So the, the stakes are a lot higher. You have to be more mature um, and the cash flow swings are much greater. So you could be out of pocket one month by like 50 grand if you buy all those windows, but the client hadn't given you an advance payment for that particular element or hadn't been valued yet, like in the JCT and REBA contracts where you're not allowed mm -hmm. to value stuff until it's fixed and on site and, you know, it's definitely the clients. So you have to be really sensitive to these things. And a lot of your time is spent purchasing, spending, spending, spending. You, you have to... By yesterday, we spent about ten thousand pounds just buying loads of sanitary ware, uh, toilet roll holders, um, asking for trade discount constantly. You know, really thinking from that perspective, um, phoning everyone constantly, like the suppliers, chasing up delivery dates, making sure the builders on site know that when things are going to arrive, so that there's someone there to take delivery or this sort of thing. Um, and you work with the, the guys on site a lot closer. Every day, phone calls, you have to be able to make decisions at short notice constantly, um, which I don't think a lot of architects would enjoy because <laughs> your concentration levels drop um, during those periods. But, um, you know, we do have architects in our practice, our architecture practice, who we outsource to our construction company, which sounds a bit funny, but... Um, you know, because they're employed by the architecture practice. And um, Matt, who works for us, I think he's really taken to the the clerical work and the sort of the sales work and quality control that isn't architecture, but he's taken to it in the building mm. side, I think in a very mature way. And you couldn't, um, you can't, no one's trained for architecture and architecture school to begin with, I would I would argue, never mind the, all this sort of clerical, um, high stakes work um, that a, arc, a construction practice asks you to have. Um, so there, there are some of the things. Um, how how does this? How has running the contracting business informed then how your architecture company is set up, and also the kind of experience that you require from your architects and the experience that they're getting. One thing that's happened, I think, with the emergence of the success of Pencil and Brick, the construction company, has been that the construction company makes us more money quicker than the architecture practice. And that's a problem and a, and a great thing, of course, at the same time. The problem is that it... Pardon me. Um, you have to reassess where the value of doing any work in an architecture practice is. Do you want to 
do you just give up the architecture practice and just do construction, you know, and just focus on that? Not at all. We're not interested in that because we really do care about improving the city and improving the way the architecture industry works and making people's homes better. But it has made us prefer not being the architect at stage five. We we'll still do it, but it's not our preference anymore, whereas before it was. Um, it also makes us think, like, how how can we speed up the architecture work and not make it too laborious so that we can get more quickly into construction? Because that's obviously where um, better profits can be made and, and without losing any quality loss because mm. we're in control of the whole process. So I mean, I mean this in... Like strictly business sense, um, in terms of design quality, we're still working overtime and you know spending way more hours than we ought to 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 get that exciting project in front of a client in in the hope that they choose it. Um, but um, there's that. We're a lot more aware of suppliers, so we have relationships with suppliers now as a building company, whereas we didn't really as an architecture practice. So we we can get quotes for projects with from suppliers, like let's say all the timber sash windows or the really fancy um, steel or zinc cladding or what have you, um, all the joinery. We can get quotes for those really early on the project, even before planning, and give and factor those into budget control conversations with the clients really early on, where we couldn't have that before. Because actually, we're a little bit scared of talking to suppliers because actually, here's a little thing right to say here. Suppliers talk to you so much more nicely and more engagingly whenever you hold the purse. <laughs> <laughs> so as the builder, you know, you start to you start to create a name for yourself amongst people who want your business. And as an yeah. architect, you do get a little touch of that. You do especially with people who are on the Reba CPD list or the, um, uh, you know, these these sorts of Reba select products and things like that. But um, boy, oh boy, do s suppliers really want to help you out in when you're the builder as well. And th for the whole project, not just, not just the build period. So the clients get to benefit from that, you know, from that um, design and build benefit, cross, cross fertilization. I'm just going to go back to what you were talking about. Um, you said you said that you, you know you guys are still putting in the hours and making sure the designs look fantastic. Um, it, is there a, a kind of an efficiency that you're beginning to see, or you're working towards, where you know we we know in architecture that you know people can end up practices can end up spending an enormous amount of time producing drawings that no one ever looks mm. at. Or drawings that you know, and again, this is the kind of hangover from university where we're really kind of wrapped up in the the power of the drawing, and it's like, well, it, the power is really in communicating an idea to someone to execute it. And then we, and particularly in the smaller residential world, how much of those drawings actually get looked at? How often do they actually ever get printed out when there's updates? But also, I can see that there's an opportunity there if you're controlling the contractor side, where actually you could get away with producing a lot less information and produce a final product which is even better than whether, even if you had done a lot of information because you're you know you can either work on it in a more improvised manner how is that beginning to form itself in the practice you've hit the nail on the head Brian clients are getting i think shafted by <laughs> normal traditional architecture practice I've never been more clear about this. Now, you might have a counter -organ. I'll give you an example. Um, it's very similar to what you're saying. Before we start pencil and brick, in, our, in Sean and Stephen, we'd do the design um, all the way up to a tender pack, which would do building regulations level um, technical design, but then go that step further for all those things that don't necessarily need building regulations, like that fancy gutter detail or you know how the floor meets the wall or that new way for a plinth block for the decoration of or for the architrave and skirting board would work or or just even like tiling layouts and uh, floorboard layouts um and um and they'd you know inevitably get either value engineered during the tender process 
<laughs> so, but who paid for that? Uh, or um, the builder just might, in one word, go, that'll never work because you start from the set night from over there. And, and you're like, oh, God, damn it. You know, they, they bulldoze <laughs> how, how, how like two days of work. Into, how do you get your fingers in to screw, the, to screw the nuts on those type of things? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and who's paid for that? It's either the architect and they weren't paid for it by the client, which is bad, or the client paid for it, which is bad, you know. Um, so it, it really is a terrible system. And I think the word traditional is probably, I have no problem with tradition. Really, I don't. I think some of the best cultural um, benefits that previous generations have brought to us are because of the culture of tradition, of hand, handing down ideas and, and how memory pervades like that. Unfortunately, crap ideas go forward too and they get handed down and they get held on to above uh, progressive notions that would help everyone. I think one of them is the traditional procurement route, the tradition the tradition of the architect in the role that they've got it really needs to expand. But our, I think clients are paying for it. Uh, they're paying over the odds for architecture services um, that aren't necessary in general. Um, but also, you know... But also, architects are paying for it because they're doing things that are inevitably not going to be remunerated properly for. Um, or it's just a lot of abortive work. So in now that we've got this construction company, we're finding that we can do building regulations drones with very little fancy stuff, just some suggestions on how um, junctions, details, or how that sort of um, you know lantern light or piece of joint, bestial joinery, would work. But we can leave that all to a conversation um, with this, with suppliers, specialist fabricators, the builders. Once we've got the project, so clients aren't paying over the odds. No, there's almost no abortive work. Because you're talking to the people who are going to build it and they either know how to do it or they don't or they mm. recommend something else. And um, and the final design decisions are, are made during construction, but we're being paid for that from the overhead and profit that's on top of the baseline construction cost. And we're being paid better than if we were paid for like some extra detailed service at stage four, you know, technical yeah. design. So... Well, what, what, Everyone what, what, wins. What is the it's the opposite. What, 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 what's the impact here as well on the team? Because again, we're talking about abortive work and you know the the kind of energy and effort that goes into doing these mm. details that end up not being used. But here, you're describing a process where actually the team doesn't have to go through that exhaustive process in the first place, and they're kind of they've got more control in the final output. So going back to that kind of question of the education of the of the architect how is how do you feel that that's influencing or the experience that it's having on your your team members i think it's dawning on both our staff and our colleagues that there's a type of builder that you don't have to um you don't have to presume that they're going for a race to the bottom in terms of quality, in terms of integrity. So, um, you know, a lot of my colleagues like QSs that we use regularly or structural engineers, that, you know, their jaws dropped whenever <laughs> we told them what we were doing. Some of them had similar ideas, but just haven't made it happen um, yet. But also we have other architect colleagues, other practices who have done this, you know, so we do have a spread. But... Um, I think that's one of the key things here is you come out of university pretty convinced that you know the cut of the world and you know builders can't be trusted architects are a noble lot who you know are right 100% of the time and um and clients are this strange um sort of thing that you do design to and it it really it turns it all on its head my staff are now saying actually that's not true. You can you can be a builder, make everything more efficient, improve the quality, do it quicker, and make more money, and make that client happier. And so it, there's sort of 
you know, this is one of the couple of light bulb moments that have happened to me in my career. Very few, but it w- it was clocking a lot of this, getting a, a smell for it just before we started Pencil and Brick, going, wow, if this is right, this, this needs to be investigated. And then finishing that first project where we had a guinea pig of a client, unfortunately, they were very kind to us, um, letting us do their project as our first build. But they're over the moon. You know, a beautiful project that's on our website, you know, like many of our other builds that are on our website. And you, you wouldn't be able to... I think now our folio on our website looks stronger, the ones that we've built, than the mm. ones that we didn't build. Whereas that tipping point maybe only occurred maybe last year, you know, because it takes a few years to go through the whole cycle of design and build. But so I'm that- I'm rambling. Well, why why did you decide to set up your own building team as opposed to just establishing a long term relationship with a with another builder? We had a long term relationship with another builder, and that broke down. Um, actually, it broke down in a project that um, they helped us get the design work to be. You know, they were introduced us to the client. Uh, who'd approached them first. We did the architecture services all the way, you know, stages one to five. And it was a really nice project, really nice, really big. And, um, but we had to be independent at stage five. And that conflict of, it's not, it's the avoidance of a conflict of interest with the client. For the contractor, that was a conflict of interest with them. Mm. So it couldn't have it both ways. We had to say, we had to tell the client, where we thought the quality of the build needed to be improved. We had to give very fair independent assessments of variations and valuations. And the contractor didn't like it one bit. And so we had to split ways, that relationship. Now, that might be one of the precursors to, you know, one of the things that helped propel us to take control of the situation. Um, But I also don't want to mince words here that's a whole separate contractor, general contractor. But in pencil and brick, we do work with um, we do work with organized builder teams, um, and we have a partner, um, an in- informal partnership with another constru- a construction company, who provides the labor, and provides the labor almost entirely just to us. Um, and that's what we want. So, you know, we want to have um, that quality control over who's on our site. These guys are known as the, the most polite builders in London. They help the neighbours <laughs> with the cat stuck up the tree or take the rubbish out or to help dig up a root in the neighbour's garden. You know, it's it's a real beautiful reputation to have. And um, and it's the, almost like the gentleman builder. I like it in a little, a little bit. That's one of the traditions I do like about architecture is the... Is the is the um, sort of the softness a lot of us have the sort of politeness? I like that part of our tradition. I don't mind that sticking <laughs> around. Um, but bringing that to being a builder now, that's that's like uh, an amazing thing to achieve, especially if you're still business astute, making clients mm. happy, make and making money for yourself. It seems uh, you know it's a it's a beautiful thing. I love it. You you were, you were mentioning earlier about the wastage that happens in the tender process on the contractor's side. Could you talk a little bit more about that and how this process kind of eliminates a lot of that? And and what were some of the problems that you were seeing from the contractor side previously? This is a fascinating conversation topic, and I've written um, on this topic. Yeah, I haven't told you, but I'm, I'm a member. Well, Pencil and Brick is a member of the Federation of Master Builders. We were really interested, like right. being in a, a REBA accredited uh, chartered practice in architecture. I wanted the equivalent standards set for the construction company, and I'm currently I'm currently being pitched to join the London board of the FMB uh, to to help on these topics, like you've just brought up. So my contention is that there we know how much it costs to tender because we've tendered it it can cost anywhere between 2 and 5000 pounds internal costs to tender for projects that are anything up to about 
two hundred to four hundred thousand pounds construction cost, excluding mm-hmm. that. If you lose one of those, imagine you lose two of those. Where where do you think that money comes from? I mean, it it's got to come from the one that you win. So. What do you do then to win the one? Let's say you lose two and you've been as honest as you can. You've given insight, um, which has inevitably increased the cost of the tender that you submit because you're trying to be as thorough as possible, um, irrespective. You're trying to be as truthful as possible so that the client can make an informed decision. But the person you're tendering against in a competitive tender has lost three in a row and this is their fourth. And they're like, you know, fifteen thousand pounds down they need to win mm-hmm. this and so there's some there's such subjectivity for a builder to um willfully or unwillfully like sort of lazily ignore some works to not include in the tender what is that what occurs there so a the outcome is that p- person on paper quickly looks uh, cheaper um Maybe they've got lower overheads, the client might think, um, or there's some. maybe they've got better discount or they've got um, supplies in stock. And that's why they're cheaper. That's not why they're cheaper. In that, you know, in that everything else being equal, uh, they're, they're creating situations to, to win a contract and, and add in costs later on in the build. They're motivated to do that. Isn't that crazy? Like, if you just think about it, it's human nature. And it's, I don't blame the builders. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I, I blame the, I blame the way things are perpetuated. Competitive tendering, going out to like three or five builders, getting them to price in detail, spending two to five thousand pounds each to do it. What a waste. And it's driving up prices it, and it, it, during construction and it's driving down integrity in tender returns. And and it, and it also damages relationships because yeah. you know I've I've seen this happen a lot when you as an architect bring uh, you know you've got a preferred builder and let's say that you you bring three or four projects on the trot and he, your preferred builder doesn't win them and another builder bit that builder's going to be like I don't want to be taking projects off you anymore. Mm, mm. I've seen that I've seen that happen and it can sort of damage yeah. a relationship or you know it's I, th- I think clients yeah. don't really well they don't care it's not their prerogative it's not they're not you know they want to get the best price yeah for their for their project they're not necessarily interested they're like well you know that's part and parcel of the game the builder has to do a do a tender but as a architect with relationships it becomes it can if, if they're not if your preferred suppliers are not winning the contracts then there's it can f- put a lot of tension on the relationship you're absolutely right you know, there's one, there's one of the problems with this situation is that no individuals to blame, like the clients aren't to blame. They they should be looking mm. after their um, bottom line. Builders aren't to blame. They're sort of arriving at this request to tender, you know, and competitively. Architects. Um, I think the architects are always to blame, but it's easy to say that because I'm an architect. <laughs> but uh, um, we're allowed but, to. We're allowed. But architects tend to be the custodians of the procurement process, or one of them anyway. So they maybe they are a bit to blame. Um, mm. And one of the um, one of the solutions to this problem is to reestablish a new 21st century. Um, procurement tradition, a new one. And that would look like trying to get the clients some confidence in budget sooner rather than later and quality sooner rather than later. Still, you could either do negotiated tender with a single builder and work until you find the right price and scope, or you could go to multiple builders. If you do multiple builders, what you really need to do is not ask too much of them up front so that there, there's not a race to the bottom. There's no motivation to undercut someone else. What what would that look like? One of the ways would be, how about sharing um, past clients' referrals, visits to other properties? That's cheap as chips and could really cut out some of the better projects on the worst projects or um, tenderers. The other way is to share what, um, declare what your overhead and profit percentage is. Do you, 
Do you add 15% on top of everything? Do you add 25% on top of everything? Do you split material cost, overhead and profit off from labor um, overhead and profit? And um, and other things like labor rates, you could say, well, this is what I charge for a uh, bricky per day. or And you could compare like for like without anyone having to spend thousands of pounds and risk in that money for the race mm -hmm. to the bottom. So I think there are solutions out there to tiptoe towards um, um, not wasting people's time, not not motivating in the wrong direction for builders around tendering. So that that's one of the reasons why I don't like competitive tendering anymore. I, being on the other side, well, it, I'm like, it, it's really interesting. I and mean, I've you know sp spoken with many contractors, and you know have had contractors, and I've heard of other architects who have had contractors come to them. And a contractor will often offer an architect a little bit of a kickback if they win the project. And I've heard many architects kind of start to get interested in doing this. Well, they're like, well, actually, you know what? We, I can make more money from a 5%, 10% kickback from the contractor if I make sure that he wins the project. And then they don't do that often because of a concern with breaking the ROB code or the ARB code or being or there being a kind of conflict of interest because it's not being fair with the with the client's decision what what do you think of of that and is that a fallacy i th i think there can be quite a lot of um backroom dealings in the whole life cycle of a construction project and yeah, everything from an architect introducing uh, uh, the structural engineer and asking for you know, some kickback. Same with um, the, a builder being introduced to a project onto a tender team and so on. And then the builder, from the builder's side, it could be about introducing the architect to the project kickback, or it could be, you know, there's a whole potential web of them. I, I think in our practice, we've always been um, I think there's a, a by default lack of integrity in the area, but you can bring integrity to it um, with full up front consent effectively from the client. Like don't, will not yeah. proceed unless you're okay with this way of doing things. Um, and um, that that's like everything down to trade discount with the supplier. You know, sometimes you get like five, 20% off some things. Um, I know that some, there's a, we're starting to tender for projects that we didn't design. And this is one of our newest strategies uh, to make sure that we've always got construction work uh, for our construction teams, even when our design projects um, have maybe like a gap between construction and so on. And so we've found that doing this with, um, on a platform to tender, that um, there's sort of, less less than top integrity um in kickbacks for for that architecture practice that would be putting us forward and i'm not particularly attracted to that i have to say and i'll probably be declaring it with the clients if they hmm. opt to go with us to, more to protect my integrity and our relationship with the client so that they can always trust us um in that regard but we're talking like five percent um, of the contract value, but it's a huge amount of money. Well, well, exactly, and I and I suppose in many cases, I know I know architects who, if they have engaged in that, then they will either declare it to the client and and show, it, or it becomes a fee. So essentially, there's a role that the contractor is. You know, they like it's like being novated essentially. So now the architect is now they're getting a a, a kind of design guardian role or something like that. And yeah, actually being paid for a service. So, but then, but then the the client is still answerable to the. It, it, again, it does it. It changes the relation, the dynamics of the relationships when that happens, because now the client is dealing with the contractor directly, and you are as the architect. You are no longer being paid, but you can't. It's very difficult to get paid two fees: one from the one from the contractor and one from the client when you're in construction. Yeah, and it becomes that becomes a that does become a conflict of interest. So you have to kind of declare it. Of, okay, well now the now the contractor becomes becomes the client, and it becomes like a straight novated 
elevated thing. That's right. I think it's, it, 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 it's sorry. Well, it, it's it's very interesting, and it and it kind of comes back to this problem that you're talking about of the the, the pain of tendering for contractors. Mm. That's why that's why contractors are even offering kickbacks yeah. in the first place. Yeah, you want to be you want to be you want nice things to be said about you in your absence. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you. But isn't that funny? Like, why why shouldn't your the your portfolio of work as a builder not speak for itself? Um, you have to ask that question. Like, what? If you don't have a folio, sure, you got to start somewhere. But same in architecture. Why not? Why are not successful projects? Here's the thing, right? Here's a great thing that we've discovered with pencil and brick. Is if you collect all the data about a project and you do like ten project construction projects, you can really assess the uplift that occurred during a project of the construction value. You can assess item by item how many of those were foreseeable, not how many, but what what value of the uplift of a contract value was foreseeable and how much wasn't. How much was sort of willful extra spend by a client to add that extra story or uh, you know buy that super expensive thing that they didn't declare at the point of signing the contract. And then what we've found is we can start to collect this data and work out averages for different sizes of projects, what one might expect for willful and un- unforeseeable uplifts. Pardon me. And, and then you can feed that information back. I can work out how many hours I spend on a construction project as project manager and effectively architect and all but name. And compare that against my um, seal return, basically the seal receipts on how much I get to keep at the end of that construction project as a business. And, um, and work out my hourly rate in reverse and things like this. And I can, I can share quite a lot of this information with my new clients. Hmm. I can say, look, th- this is how much it costs me to to do it. This is how much you should expect to hedge your bets before construction and during construction. And I've, I tell you what, I've just never had a builder use data back to me to sort of guide expectations or improve trust. Like, um, there's a wealth of information there, and every time we complete another project, I think we become more valuable to the next client. Um, because of that. So I'm really excited um, in the next couple of years to use that data um, for even more interesting insights. So in terms of uh, the future and how you see Pencil and Brick evolving, what's next for you guys in uh, for 2022? And are, are there a number of different ways that the business could unfold that you've kind of got on the in the business plan, if you like? When we did this Grow Your Practice course, uh, which spanned a few months um, for architecture directors, in 2000, maybe 16, 2017, one of the amazing light bulb moments again that, um, that we had was establishing your core market in your business. And then if you want to grow, don't grow forward, grow sidewards. Take one step to the side. And what that might mean, like with our architecture practice, we grew by take by saying, well, let's not just go for a million and mil- multi-million pound projects. Instead of growing that way, let's grow by taking on construction. That was a big sidestep, but it was a sidestep. We've done that. Now we're thinking, what is, what is the next sensible sidestep that's got to be cautious, ambitious, 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 at the minute, the minute we're going to rename Sean and Stephen to Stephen Stone Brick and align the brands of the two companies and offer a more um, one house design and build offer. And we're going to look, that's an easy thing to do. Um, but what we're going to look at is potentially, I don't want to give away too much, but the idea of some off the shelf construction projects now why i'm saying that what if there was a design um that was apart from some of the architectural devices like some double height spaces and special alignments with the sun and um beautiful materials what if you could pick uh 
an architectural palette of architectural devices and materials, including like kitchens and mm. things like that for private resi. And if you selected that and we knew some basic information about your building that you could, we could give you a fixed construction cost and design cost before you've even ha had any design done. Now, there'd be a lot of restrictions about it, but this is, I think this is a really exciting thing that might come up in the future, the few, next few years. Part of it, this is the thing that excites me probably the most, is I think to do it, we'd need to start a tech company. <laughs> To because there's quite a lot of uh, interactive database and user experience graphic interface on a, on websites that would be required to make this uh, a sellable product, but it's the logical next step I think um, to make it. Why? Because everyone likes to have a better sense of fixed costs, so they know what they're going into. I don't know anyone else that's mm. offering this in the UK. Um, so the competition market's quite low. Now that I'm on this amazing podcast, I'm sure 10 people will be doing it now before I get to the market. Um, but also I think a lot of people, are customers are getting used to using um, online dashboards and client portals for managing their information, sharing information, checking on progress. I certainly did, you know, my solicitors who did the conveyancing of me by my house gave me a dashboard online to log into and check how far their searches were doing and so on. And I really enjoyed that. So learning from the tech companies, um, learning from startups that are not architecture, learning from um, solicitors who are like online only, and learning from even these, you know, these cheapo loft companies and cheapo extension companies that go around, they have a really yeah. streamlined service I'll give you an example. I've got in my hands right here, I, I got some planning permission for a, um, a loft extension at my house, right? Because I've got a kid on the way, new baby. And I need that room. And before I've even got the permission through, a loft company has sent me a, a tender for the construction works. Now, I'm disgusted and <laughs> overjoyed by that in equal measures. You know, I'm like, you don't know what my project's like, but how snobbish mm. can architects be right the i my instinct is to be a bit snobbish about that but i love that go get them um approach like why can't we think into the future and give some fixed costs with the appropriate caveats why can't we you know why why don't we do that in architecture why don't we do that in pencil and brick so i'm i'm t i think that's where the next few years are coming T together this this idea of learning from the peripheries of the industry and taking that sidestep in that direction love it that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation sean thank you so much for sharing with us the insights that you've gotten from pencil and brick and the very exciting yeah. things that you're you're doing and your experience and insights into procurement really really fascinating conversation yeah. on on what could be a new procurement tradition Brilliant. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Ryan. Thanks for having me on again. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.